Salute a gray, yeah, yeah, yeah. Salute a gray. Jerry. I'm from Madison County. I was born on a little 69-acre farm 90 years ago in a little log house that's still standing that my mother and father built with their own hands for $212. Wow. <laughs> my mother was from a large family and her, uh, her father would give each of the children a cow when they got married but he didn't have a cow, cow when my mother got married so he gave them ten dollars <laughs> they took the ten dollars and put the doors and the windows in the little log house <laughs> i can remember uh, growing up uh, we grew tobacco and cattle and i can remember selling cattle for two cents a pound wow. and i can remember selling burly tobacco for 10 cents a pound. A nickel, a nickel looked big as a wagon wheel. <laughs> we had one mule and, uh, and my grandpa had a mule. So uh, Marshall High School, Brill College for poor mountain boys. Each child, each student had to work at least two hours a day. And if you didn't know what job to bid on, they would assign you a job. Real College owned a whole little town up there, and part of their holdings was a boom tavern, a big hotel, a dining room, boat. And so my first job at Real College was carrying trays from the kitchen out in the dining room, 18 cents an hour. <laughs> but you didn't get the 18 cents. You, it, went on, it went on your tuition. Uh, as soon as I got out of uh, graduating Bria, Corps in War, uh, my kin folks, uh, EY and Zeno, uh, uh, made sure that I got drafted <laughs> in the first round. Heavy tank outfit, uh, Fort Hood, Texas, and we went out to Camp Irving, California, cadre outfit. Recalled off a 90 millimeter gun and a M46 Panton tank. Busted my back all to pieces. Back to Camp Pope and back to Fort Hood, Fourth Army Hospital and Brook Army Hospital, San Antonio, Texas. And neurosurgeon, I wish you, I wish I knew where he was at. I'd give him a country ham or buy him a Jack Daniels or something. Like he passed me up and said, uh, "This is a little crude, but this is what he told me." He said, uh, "We've got you patched up, but don't." Ever lift anything heavier in a woman's skirt, and you'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to Madison County, and uh, Zeno was a chairman of the Democrat Party, and his brother EY was a Madison County sheriff, and Liston Ramsey was a speaker of the House, and uh, Eldridge Leak was a county attorney, and they, they said, uh, as Mr. Rapp has already alluded to, they said, see you, see you in hell before you get a job in Madison County. <laughs> <laughs> so my father was a good friend of Sheriff Jesse James Bailey, only man in the history of North Carolina, sheriff in two counties. He worked for the railroad and police and got a leave of absence, ran for sheriff in Madison, and that is awful hard on the bootleggers. <laughs> oh, those, those are corn liquor stills that he cut down, and that's, that picture's made in front of the Madison County Courthouse. Went back to the railroad and worked a little while and then got a leave of absence and ran for sheriff in Buncombe County. He was elected sheriff in Buncombe County. Went back to the railroad and along about a little before I got discharged in 1953, and he talked kind of like me through his nose. Told my father, tell that boy to come and see me. <laughs> <laughs> I went to see Sheriff Jesse James Bailey. We were supposed to have 
stayed in Iceville, but we got hired in Iceville, but the job didn't come open immediately, so sent to New Orleans, Louisiana. I hadn't hardly been out of Madison County. I didn't know where in the world New Orleans was. <laughs> anyway, Southern Railway had two big ocean-going docks down there where copra, dried coconut meat, uh, ship loads would come in, maybe 150 train loads of dried coconut meat, and it'd go to Cincinnati, Procter & Gamble to make soap and shampoo and all that of and then raw sugar, sugar boats, and that was mainly. So I got a job punching a watch clock going around those big docks, $325 a month, tickle to death to get it. That's all the money in the world. So one of the first things I done went in a grocery store and there was, there was live crawfish. I said, anybody eat that, there's something wrong with it. <laughs> in six months, we got into those cages down there. We was in the bayou catching those crawfish. <laughs> we, we, and we still love. Still got some good friends. Still got some good friends in, in New Orleans. Got a big promotion. Made junior patrolman and, and uh, the train bulletin board here is my moves. 53 and Higher Nashville to New Orleans, Birmingham, Knoxville, Sheffield, back to Asheville 14 months, Hickory, big, uh, big sergeant in Hickory, Memphis, Cincinnati, then the old Southern Railway headquarters in Washington, and, and, and then we merged with NW and North Horton Western in 82, they moved Southern headquarters to Atlanta. And, uh, then I wound up at Roanoke. I didn't never like Roanoke, and I did not put Roanoke on the bottom of the book. <laughs> <laughs> but I told them, I told them, uh, trying to run a railroad out of Roanoke is like trying to have sex standing up in a hammock. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that 30, true story, true story. 30 years later, as we speak today, Norfolk Southern, nearly a eight billion dollar relocation moving Norfolk's headquarters to North Peachtree Street in Atlanta, Georgia. Right across the, right across the street from the Warsties. They go across the street and get them a hot dog. But it, it took them 30, 30, 30 years to listen to me, but they, uh, so my junior patrolman had come to Birmingham about a thirty dollar a month raise. Got transferred to Knoxville in fifty seven. They wanted me to broaden my experience. I didn't get a promotion, didn't get any more money. <laughs> Sheffield, Alabama, I got in with a farmer. The director was a farmer, and he had a cousin that was a captain of the Memphis Division. So he, I got transferred over there, and I got labeled as being a farmer boy. <laughs> and the farmer, Mr. Farmer and Mr. Frank Smith, he was the vice president. They were cross politics. So... I got on the wrong side of the politics. I wore the railroad out as a patrolman. They sent me everywhere to broaden my experience. <laughs> in, 60, in 65, Sanford Farmer, who was the chief over there at Sheffield, he got transferred to the, the captain that actually got drunk on a dove hunt, and they transferred. They didn't fire, Mr. Brosnan didn't fire him but he sent him away where he wouldn't see him no more. <laughs> so in 1965, Mr. Brosnan, had, he had one son, a brilliant eye doctor, and the son had three grandchildren. So Mr. Brosnan, he hated Washington. So he moved to 12 Lone Pine, built more forest. And for three years, he ran Southern Railway from Biltmore Forest. In those three years, as Mr. Rapp already said, he, it, was, it, was, it was a true fact. He, had, he was really, really hard on labor, but he was fire. And they, they put a contract. And he wouldn't go, he went to the Kentucky Derby. I went to the Kentucky Derby. I was a big patrolman making $450 a month. The president of General Motors Locomotive Division, he slipped on one end of the office car and I slipped on the other end. <laughs> He loved old mountain boys. He loved uh, 
and he and he had his little group. And now he might raise Cain with you, but nobody else on the railroad bothered you. As as a D.W. Bryson's boy, and I found out one way that you could get next to him. You you, of course, he he loved the grandchildren. But you can buy the little grandchildren a little present, <laughs> or you give them a funny book, or you done a little something out of the way. And now I, I tell them now, I say, go tell your grandpa, go tell your grandpa. And they would. They would. So, <laughs> so I, I, I loved the old man. I, it, he, was never, he was never at ease around him. Most brilliant man, he had them big brown eyes, and he could look a hole through you. He could, he could. But, he, and we're still riding on things, ribbon rail. When I went to work, rail's 39 feet long, a joint. Ribbon rail, 1,470 feet long. And he put a welding shop in Atlanta, and he welded enough rail for all the other railroads to pay for the ribbon rail for Southern Railroad. Microwave, he was the first, Southern Railroad was the first railroad major company to have their own microwave system. And he, and he took the suit all the way to the Supreme Court and, and against Maul Bell and, and, and won. Uh, he completely, he was the first, Southern Railway in 51 was the first major railroad to completely dieselize. He built the second hump yard in the United States, and, we, and we, of course we still use them. Just, and on and on, uh, uh, when I went to work, it took 80 men to lay a mile of rail a day. He come up with a equipment, 18, 18 men with a ribbon rail equipment could lay five, could now lay five miles of track a day. Oh, oh, no. and and he and he loved the police. He loved, he, he'd give he'd give the management family maybe a ten percent raise. He'd give us twelve or fifteen percent raise. <laughs> loved the dove hunt. Had a big. In fact, he bought a farm just outside of Knoxville just because it had a good dove fields on it. <laughs> I loved him. I was afraid of, I was afraid of him, but I loved him. I, and uh, he later got he retired and. Uh, he, well, he got kind of forced out. They bought to uh, Central of Georgia, and without saying anything to anybody, he, he cut up cut off all the pasture, all the pasture service, and he got sued. And uh, and they they wound up they wound up paying a forty million dollar settlement, but as it turned out, he saved uh, Southern Railroad about a hundred million dollars. By doing all that reduction at one time, and they but in '67 they did force him. They did, and he retired there in Asheville, and uh, he, he developed cancer about three or four years later. And his son, who was a brilliant eye doctor, sent him to Emory for cancer treatment, and uh, he sent the company plane down there. He was allergic to it, and. Uh, I, I always regret it. We went out there and picked him up at Emory and uh, carried him back to the company plane. And uh, the pilot said, ride. Uh, he, he still raised a lot of hell. And they said, ride with us to Asheville. And I had a little old meeting, and I should have rode with him. And he didn't live with a couple, about a couple of months. But he was, he. So uh, while at Asheville, our territory was saluted here and of course they had the coal trains and Belmont coal train and regular freight trains and they'd put, come to regular air pressure uh, train brakes are act activated by air pressure and the regular train line has 75 pounds of air but the coal trains and the trains that went down saluted they'd pull up here and turn up the retainers and pump the train pressure up to 90 pounds on the train line. And you could it'd go off the map, especially at night. I don't know if you, you know, may have seen them, but every brake shoe on every car, the sparks were just pouring off of it. It looked like a whole mountain was on fire. And I don't know why, but a passenger train in the, in the, the uh, telephone lines, copper, solid copper lines, when the copper would get to a dollar a pound scrap, that's all we done. We stayed over here on the mountain because they'd cut it down faster as we could catch them. <laughs> well, the chief deputy's son at, at uh, Polk County, 
call us. We called him, and uh, we, we hoped, we wished we hadn't called him, but we got him. We we got they gave him probation. But I remember that caught a hobo on the coal train over here, and uh, supposedly he had turned automatic sanders up and uh, spilled out all the sand on the engines. Dick Perkins and I come over here, and there was a magistrate about halfway down the mountain. I can't remember his name. We took that old hobo down there and took him before that magistrate. 11 months and 29 days probation. We brought him out and gave him $5 and put him on the bus and sent him to Spartanburg. <laughs> <laughs> That's the gate to Brosnan Forest. 16,000 acres. Uh, 300 miles of road, and when I was, when I was working, we, that was part of our duties. The budget was a million and a half dollars a year, 45 employees. Southern had three Gulf streams, and I was in the railroad police business, and uh, I wasn't very smart, but I knew that I needed all the help. So they would let me have two hunts at Brosnan Forest. So I'd, get those Gulf streams, and if you was a chief of police in Kansas City, I would send and get you. And the bar was never closed. <laughs> and I would pick you up in Charleston and bring you to Bryson Forest. And I learned two things. You could not never shoot up all the shotgun shells, and you could not never drink all the adult beverage. I tried, I tried both of them. But, and, and when we, all the guns, all the, Shells, all the game, all the food, all the license. Three-day hunt. That's, that's about as much as your shoulder could stand. <laughs> and, uh, I had a, and I got to where I couldn't walk. I had a great old big covered wagon and a big team of mules and folks like me couldn't walk. They'd put the quail out beside the driveway. <laughs> you'd ride the wagon out and the bird dogs would, and you'd get off the wagon and shoot the puppy ride. And then if you want to. <laughs> but we'd pack you a big game box quail, pheasant, trout, deer, uh, chucker, and put and put you back on the plane. And, and while you were down there, I wrote your name down. And if I ever needed anything in Kansas City, <laughs> Cleveland, Ohio, New Orleans, Louisiana, I, I, I could always get a call through. Always get a call through. <laughs> Mr. D.W. Brosnan loved country music. And on the Carolina Division, when he was running the railroad, they said, to get a job on the Carolina Division, you didn't have to know how to play a guitar. We'd give you 30 days to <laughs> play a guitar. Look, we'd give you 30 days to learn. So we took it. It, 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 it was in members of the Railroad Police Department who could play a guitar. And it's really, really, it's about the third generation now. And when we, we're, we're going to get to that. But we took him. He would have staff meetings out at Allwood. And uh, the band went out there and played. And it, is, the, uh, is the band still together? The band is still together and about the third or fourth generation and they're headquartered down at Bronson Forest. And they, and one little perk I still get, uh, they, I have a cookout barbecue for the Smoky Mountain Police and the following year out on our farm and they still come up and play. When I went to Memphis, I got into that as a barbecue capital of the world, I, I got in those boys over there taught me how to cook. And the first thing we done was cook the big coon before we put the hog on. But when I went to Cincinnati as a division chief, the uh, master mechanic up there, head of the mechanical department, he was from Salisbury and he, and he loved it. So we got us 40 cinder blocks and a little two wheel trailer, four gang boards off an old railroad box car, and we haul them around and cook a hog. We could cook one. And we got, we, we was cooking at Cincinnati, Greater Cincinnati Airport, and the uh, hog caught on fire. And uh, he, uh, old, old Bill said, where in the world are we gonna get 300 pounds of chicken? We scraped, <laughs> we, we scraped that hog off, we scraped it, just charred it. it we, the best barbecue we ever cooked. <laughs> I told him, I said, if we ever amount to anything, we gonna build us a barbecue cook. I never did amount to anything, but he got promoted to uh, general manager of the Coster Roadway Shops, and we built. I, I, call, I was the mouthpiece, and uh, he said, "You call my boss and get us permission 
I called his boss and told him it'd be cost five thousand dollars. The trailer just cost more than five thousand dollars. But we built a twenty four foot long, triple deck, fifty two hundred pound, fold down spoke stack, load levelers, uh, uh generator with lights, uh Food box, wood box, uh, I, and I burned up two police cruisers before I got sense enough to get a suburban tow of that thing. But we could cook seventy, we could cook seventy hams on that thing at one time, and we took it all over the railroad. We took it for police, FBI uh, training sessions, uh, state police training sessions, you know, and we'll jump the gun a little bit. Uh, the, the Association of American Railroad Police had for at least 20 years, maybe 30, tried to get a bill through the United States Congress giving railroad police a federal commission like the FBI and Secret Service. And we took those, that cooker around to all over uh, Norfolk Southern for a couple of years. And you talk about kissing up and politicking and, <laughs> and talking good. But, but we got all, we got the entire police community uh, on our side. And then uh, this is the major crime bill of 1990. And I learned a long time you didn't, you want to get your legislative matters attached to something that was going to pass. <laughs> so we got two, we got two pages of the Railroad Police Federal Commission in this bill. And Mr. Strom Thurman, Mr. Strom Thurman got it through the Senate. And Bush one was supposed to have signed it in the, White, in the Rose Garden, and we was going to go over and make pictures. Well, he was working on that NAFTA deal. So Strom said, y'all come on up here, and we'll make all the pictures y'all want to make. So that's me and old Strom up there, and, and uh, that was my last goal. I've kind of jumped ahead, but he said, how many children do you have? I said, two sons. So he autographed two copies. He said, it'll be something your children are proud of. So he, he, that's a, that, was, that was my last goal, and that's something I was really proud of. I was really Those railroad men, they know you better drive that train. That train will drive you down on the way to that graveyard at the end. Big cut they call slaughter pen. <laughs>